Dr. Hancock joined the faculty at K-State University in 1987 and retired to Texas in 2017, correct? So uh, e again, each, each of these gentlemen have their respective areas of expertise, and so first we'll start with uh, Dr. Hancock. Welcome. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad all of you can make it in <clears throat> and take this opportunity to brainstorm a little bit and think about sorghum and its use in animal feeding. Um, when we think of sorghum grain, really we're, we're thinking of a starch source. And when, as we formulate diets for animals, the first thing we do is add ingredients to meet their energy needs. And our cheapest source of calories in animal diets is invariably some sort of starch source. In the U.S., undeniably, that primary starch source that's utilized is corn. And you ask yourself, why corn? Well, certainly, it's about where it's raised to a large extent. This area of the United States, we call the Midwestern United States, we call it the breadbasket of the United States, we call it the Midwest of the United States, and it actually, the Corn Belt, whatever you want to call it, this area, particularly the I states, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, <clears throat> southern Minnesota, have our best soils, they're deep, they're rich, they have ample rainfall, and that rainfall has a nice distribution pattern throughout the growth cycle of a crop. And so we get tremendous yields. It's a greenhouse. This is our major area for corn production, major area for soybean production. And then we have the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes region and a pretty good rail system in the U.S. so that we can move those crops around. And so it's not a problem getting the corn and the soy out of the Midwestern U.S to our east coast, west coast, or wherever to use it in animal feed. So, so corn is king. Yields well, good growing conditions, and we can move it around. Animals like it. So it's, it is definitely king of our cereal substrates. So we've always looked to corn as our primary energy source for use in animal feed. And we rocked along and for ages is dollar a bushel and then it crept up to two dollars a bushel then all of a sudden in 2005 this happened we had an energy policy act and our folks in Washington DC decided that we needed we needed some renewable fuel sources to to drive our automobiles to drive our trucks and so forth in the US just some kind of renewable fuel to lessen our dependence on imported oil so it was viewed as good energy policy also, there's always the politics involved with our farm program and, and a burgeoning and stable ethanol industry was viewed as a way to inflate corn prices and also stabilize those corn prices to help our farmers. And then finally, ethanol burns clean compared to our fossil fuels, so it was viewed as good environmental policy as well. So this happened. We had these little small and not so small ethanol plants start to crop up all over the Midwestern United States. And there was a lot of speculation about where all of this was going and a lot of, a lot of opportunism. People jumping into this business thinking that it was the future of our fuel supply in the U.S. And the net effect you can see in this graph for years and years we were a little over $2 a bushel. We got very accustomed to that in the livestock feeding sector. Then in 2005, with this renewable fuel mandate going into effect, we saw speculation on where the corn prices were going to go. And then we saw a real demand for that corn crop into the ethanol industry. And we saw, we saw our first spike in, first, uh, there we go. First major spike in corn prices in about 2008 or so. This resulted in actually the bankrupting of some of our larger livestock operations in the United States. If you look at a, a typical poultry diet, you might be 60-70% cereal grain. If you look at a typical swine diet, you might be 70-80% cereal grain. Our feed costs in the U.S. are 70 plus percent of our total cost of production. And that's true in poultry, that's true in swine as well. And so all of a sudden, 
you're rocking along here at a little over two dollars a bushel and you increase that price up to five six dollars a bushel and you can imagine the shock waves that sense of the livestock feeding sector and then in the 2012 we had another major spike and we were up seven dollars a bushel and we were used to two dollars a bushel so that corn is you know 60 70 percent of your formulation diet cost or 70 percent of your production cost so it's not hard to do the math and understand what this meant to our livestock feeding sector in the u.s <clears throat> even more startling to us and part of the speculation that you see going on here is that we had folks predicting that the ethanol industry would consume our entire corn crop within a decade or so and that there would be no corn for use in livestock feeding so so lots of concern and then things kind of settled down uh, kind of saw where this was going and we saw a decrease in our corn prices and they seem to have reset about 350 a bushel or so bouncing up and down a bit but uh, I think we've, got, we've seen a reset in our commodity price with corn with a ethanol industry taking up a portion of that what this did and where this relates to sorghum is that with these spikes in corn prices and the near panic that caused in the livestock feeding sector that sent us on a quest as nutritionists trying to find an affordable calorie and this is where sorghum grain comes in I mentioned that our best soils <clears throat> and our corn and soy producing regions are here in the Midwest United States as you move outside that circle you start getting into less fertile soils you start getting into less rainfall and you start getting into more erratic rainfall patterns this is actually where sorghum excels it uh, takes quite a bit less moisture we used to say about half the total moisture of a corn crop to make an average sorghum crop but but much less moisture more drought tolerant and it's just a little more hardy creature than our corn plants are those major sorghum producing areas would be on the outside of our corn producing areas in fact Kansas leads the United States in sorghum production Texas typically is number two uh, Nebraska for years and years and years was number three again I actually grew up in the southern part of the panhandle then moved up to Nebraska for a PhD and then was on faculty there at Kansas State for 30 years so I'm very accustomed to seeing sorghum grown and seeing sorghum used in livestock diets and that's why I've always been kind of a champion of sorghum and that's why I feel quite comfortable sharing with you some of my thoughts on how it can be best utilized but before we start to think of sorghum and, and take that seriously as, as a dietary ingredient, we need to get past some of the myths that abound, and there are several. The first of those is that sorghum has a low content and availability of nutrients. So what I did is I took our existing poultry NRC, which is, is getting quite dated. There's supposedly one in the mill that will be out quite soon. These are the numbers from that NRC, the requirements of a zero to three week old broiler chick for our amino acids I then took corn and the protein in that and expressed that corn number as a percentage of the requirement so in other words corn will meet about 31 percent of the arginine requirement I did the same thing for sorghum sorghum will meet about 29 percent of the arginine requirement based on our current poultry NRC as you scroll down through here you see that for lysine a key amino acid corn gets 24 percent sorghum 20 percent so a bit of an advantage for sorghum or for corn there uh, if you look at methionine plus cysteine 41 versus 38 a little bit of advantage to corn but once again they're pretty close uh, you look at some of the others like tryptophan sorghum comes in higher than corn if you look at valine sorghum comes in higher than corn so we're jumping back and forth no consistent pattern maybe even more important is that we're talking 20 30 percent of the requirement for most of our key amino acids so it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about corn or sorghum they're both lousy sources of amino acids cereal grains are not added to our diets as an amino acid source they're added to our diets as an energy substrate in our diets sorghum 
It's full of tannins. This one I run into all over the globe. It doesn't really matter where I go to speak. And in fact, if you look at feeding projects where tannin sorghums have been compared to non-tannin sorghums, they do have a negative effect. These are some data we generated a few years ago in broiler chicks. We had a corn control, we had a non-tannin sorghum, and we had a tannin sorghum. And as you might expect, the corn and the sorghum, non-tannin sorghum, very similar in these broiler chicks. Tannin sorghums, a significant decrease. If I feed tannin sorghums to broiler chicks, I can expect a 5 to 10 percent reduction in growth performance. If I feed tannin sorghums to pigs, I can expect a 5 to 10 percent reduction in amino acid digestibility and growth performance. It's real. But when you listen to people talk about tannins, you think that they're poisonous the way people talk about them. Here we're talking about a 5 to 10 percent reduction in growth performance in a very sensitive model, a broiler chick. When we start thinking about humans <clears throat> and start talking about humans, my colleagues in the human nutrition circle will actually tell you that they don't mind tannins. They have antioxidant properties and they think they might have some, some positive effects in reducing the incidence of cancer, some kinds of cancers in humans. You had tannins probably today, actually, you certainly probably did yesterday. Have you ever eaten a grape? The seed coat kind of has that bitter taste, that's tannins. Have you ever consumed a cup of tea and chewed on the tea leaves? That bitter taste in those tea leaves, those are tannins. Chocolate, if you've ever eaten unsweetened chocolate, how bitter and nasty unsweetened chocolate is. As a child, when you make the mistake of thinking it's a Hershey's bar and it's real chocolate powder, it's, it's terribly bitter. Those are tannins. We consume tannins all the time. Red wine, tannins. And now they're talking about health benefits in humans, but they're not worried about a 5% reduction in energy digestibility or amino acid digestibility in humans. In fact, for me, that would probably be, I need about a 20% reduction in digestibility of nutrients to see if I could lose some weight. In pigs and poultry, that doesn't fly. I mean, you've got to have maximum rate and efficiency of gain to stay in business. So they're not toxic. The even more important aspect of tannin sorghums, for this project, we actually worked with Pioneer Seed at the time to get the corn, to get the non-tannin sorghum, the tannin sorghum. We grew them in Manhattan, Kansas in adjacent plots because we couldn't find any tannin sorghums to use in our, in our chick feeding assay. So we grew our own. Also, that eliminated environmental effects that might impact nutritional quality of those cereal grains by growing them. We, we identity preserved those, we ground them, we fed them. If you want to buy tannin sorghums right now in the United States, good luck. I don't think you're going to find them. We don't produce them. That's just, just something, if you do find them, it's going to be some kind of niche deal. But our commodity sorghums are non-tannin sorghums. And in fact, if you import sorghum from the United States, it will be non-tannin sorghum. That's part of our grading standards. So it's a non-issue, even if you wanted to find it. Myth three, sorghum is difficult to process and non-responsive or not responsive to some of our more advanced feed manufacturing technologies. I will argue just the opposite. Let's start with our simplest of our milling technologies, grinding. Why do we do that? <clears throat> Dr. Paul is in our grain science department there at Kansas State, and he will tell you that he likes to grind cereal grains and feed ingredients to enhance mixing characteristics and to decrease segregation. As we take feed ingredients that are vastly different in particle size and vastly different in bulk density, they don't like to mix together very much and they won't stay together, they segregate. You know, you take soybean holes versus monocalcium phosphate and you move them around, the monocalcium phosphate tends to sink to the bottom and the soybean holes tend to float to the top. If you can grind those ingredients to a fairly similar particle size, a fine particle size, they will mix together better and they will stay together better. As a nutritionist though, I like to grind ingredients to increase nutrient digestibility, and it does. As you decrease particle size, you increase surface area. As you increase surface area, enzymes have more potential for interaction with that particle, and so you naturally get greater nutrient digestibility. 
what does that mean in livestock feeding? We had a chance a few years ago, <clears throat> I had a student from uh, Costa Rica, and we were contacted by the Sorghum Producers Association in Nicaragua, and they were wanting to do some projects. We had done several of these there at K-State, comparing locally produced sorghum and corn. They wanted to do the same thing in Nicaragua. So we got in contact with the Agricultural University there in Managua. I loaded my graduate student up, we flew down and we did a chick feeding assay. So we spent a little quality time in their feed mill, making their diets and putting birds on tests. These are the results. Our treatments were a corn control ground to 1200 and 600 microns and our sorghum treatment ground to 1200 and 600 microns. <clears throat> in our corn control, a bit of an increase in average daily gain of these broiler chicks in our corn-based treatments, but for sorghum, this is the big winner. Is it 1,200 microns inferior to our corn treatments? At 600 microns, as good as the best of our corn treatments. And that is the reason I would argue that historically, much of the advantage in feeding value that you see for corn-based diets versus sorghum-based diets is simply the result of not properly processing the sorghum. You got to get those kernels broken and sorghum is extremely responsive to particle size reduction. Other technologies that are worthy of consideration, certainly roasting and toasting, are talked about. We've done a bit of it in uh, poultry and pigs over the years there at K-State. Really haven't seen much that you could get excited about. Roasted or toasted soybeans, a different deal, but for cereal grains, really not much there. Extrusion. We've done some of that at K-State in sorghum-based diets. <clears throat> the not so much in broilers. We saw some nice response in newly weaned pigs, but the processing costs negated the improvements in feed efficiency in terms of economic advantage. <clears throat> there was an effect there. It's just an expensive technology. So if you're going to extrude feedstuffs, you need to target an animal that you can price the end product, your feed, high enough to get back your extrusion costs and make some money in addition to that. That would be aquaculture feeds, that would be pet foods, which Dr. Aldrich is going to discuss with you, and that would be even human foods, human snacks. But for pigs and poultry, not so good, and certainly not for ruminant animals on the extrusion side. That leaves us with steam flaking and pelleting. Those are a different stories. So we'll start with steam flaking. In the steam flaking process, you add your cereal grains into a steam chest. You pump steam into that, it softens that kernel. You then drop that kernel through a set of flaking rolls, and those flaking rolls crush that kernel into a flake. Think of a corn flake, not nearly that advanced, but same concept. And you don't want to grind it, you just crush it into a flake, and then you present that to your animals. We've done a bit of that in pigs and poultry, really nothing there. That's not the case for ruminant animals. These are some data from Dr. Tal Huber at Arizona State University. He took corn, he fed it rolled and steam flake. He took sorghum and fed it rolled and steam flake. These are the numbers for milk yield, a nice response with steam flaking in both corn and sorghum based diets. In terms of efficiency, these numbers are for fat corrected milk per unit of dry matter intake. Corn at 1200 or rolled versus steam flake, very comparable in terms of efficiency of conversion of that diet to milk. But sorghum, clear winner when we go from rolled, which was inferior to our corn treatments, to steam flake, which was good as the best of our corn treatments. So, very similar to our chick data with fine grinding of sorghum grain. And that is that. The sorghum was more responsive to some of our advanced feed technologies and paying close attention to our feed processing technologies as compared to a corn-based diet. Similar results in feedlot cattle. Uh, Dr. Bob Brent there at Kansas State University did a nice project, <clears throat> looked just like Tal Huber's project in, in dairy cattle in that the sorghum-based diets were slightly inferior to corn when dry rolled, but equal when steam flaked. And I think that's a primary reason that if you go into a western Kansas, you go into the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles, you go to a beef feedlot, they run steam flakers. Everything's steam flaked. 
they will tell you they get a 5 to 10 percent improvement in efficiency of growth on steam flake grains versus dry roll grains. <clears throat> so it is the norm for ruminant diet, steam flaking, and sorghum will respond more than corn. That leaves us with pelleting, a major technology used in non-ruminant diets, both swine and poultry. If you go to our major poultry integrators in the U.S., all of the broiler diets are pelletized. If you go to a major pig integrator in the U.S., all of their grow finished diets are pelletized. The reason is you see a 5 to 6% five to six improvement in rate and efficiency of gain with pelleting. So it's done extensively in the U.S. The bad news for sorghum, I guess if there is any, is that in pellet quality, in terms of pellet quality, and you have to have pellet quality to get that 5 or 6% improvement in growth performance, you have to have a good pellet. In other words, you can't just simply pass it through a pelleting die and have those pellets fall apart before the animal consumes them. You have to have a good quality pellet so that those animals are consuming pellets. What we know, and we've done a bunch of this at Kansas State, when we use rice, we use cassava, we use wheat in our diets as a carbohydrate source, we get tremendous pellet quality. And in fact, I've heard of people using a bit of wheat as a pellet binder when they're having trouble with pellet quality. Cassava or rice would do the same thing, broken rice, if you can get them at a reasonable price. Corn and sorghum, not as good. And if you've ever pelletized corn sorghum based diets, you know that it's a bit of a challenge. You probably have to slow your mill down a bit. You have to pay attention to your conditioning and hopefully avoid pellet binders because, for instance, sodium bentonite takes up room in your formula and adds no nutrients. So you'd rather not do that if you can avoid it. And there's a cost to that as well. So modifying your processing technology is probably your best bet. As far as corn, versus sorghum, pellet quality, we really hadn't seen any difference, very comparable. If you have trouble with corn-based diets, you'll have trouble with sorghum-based diets. If you don't have trouble with corn-based diets, then you won't have trouble with sorghum-based diets. There's really not any difference there. The one thing that I would add is we did some work with waxy sorghums, and we got a really nice bump in pellet quality. If I can just convince Dr. Rooney that everything needs to go to a waxy sorghum, and have him get on the ball so we don't get a yield drag, then, uh, then we'll have better, better pellet quality to deal with in the future. So in conclusion, sorghum's an excellent feedstuff for livestock and poultry. Fears about anti-nutrients and variability in nutrient content are generally unfounded. Proper milling, though, is critical in a sorghum-based diet. I would say even more important than in a corn-based diet. Pay attention to your milling technologies. You should be doing that anyway. And don't be afraid of complete and or abrupt substitutions. This is, this is one I always marvel at. Latin America, you guys, for some reason, are scared to death of a complete substitution. I might add 10% sorghum, I might add 20, but I don't, want to add, I don't want to make a complete substitution. And abrupt substitutions. Well, I can tell you in the, in the U.S. that if the price is right, they will switch from corn to sorghum tomorrow. If the price is right, they will switch from sorghum to corn next week, or corn to wheat, or sorghum to wheat. Those three primary cereal grains, we make abrupt and total substitution at the drop of a hat in the U.S. and never think twice about it. We've done a bit of that work at Kansas State, changing from corn to sorghum and sorghum to corn versus feeding them continuously and you don't see any negative effects from abrupt and total substitution. You can do it. So with that, I will uh, conclude and turn the floor over to Dr. Aldrich. <laughs>